Welcome to the Bridge Builder Program, an initiative of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, where we help you live your faith in the public arena. I'm Jason Adkins, Executive Director of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, and joining me is our producer and Minnesota Catholic Conference Communications Manager, Kit Sapiniak. Hey, Kit. Hey, Jason. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in again this week. As you do every week, we're so grateful for all of our listeners and now all of our viewers on the YouTube channel as well. And you can always catch us on your favorite podcast app, too. And all of our past episodes are found at mncatholic.org forward slash podcast. We have so much great content there, so make sure to really check it out. And we've got even more great content to add today. Jason, who are you speaking with this week? Well, we are blessed to have in the program Danielle Brown. Uh, Danielle is a native Detroiter like myself, and she is the Associate Director of the Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. So we're going to have a really great and important discussion, a lot about a lot of hot topics. Critical race theory is a question that keeps coming up, and what is that and what to do about it, but also the connection between the church's efforts to combat racism and evangelization and the sin of racism and what all that means and uh, how to unpack that and think about it. And Danielle is just so very good and a resource for that. So we're looking forward to that conversation. It sounds like it's definitely a very timely conversation. We're hearing a lot in the news and in the you know, mainstream media surrounding you know, Martin Luther King Jr. And Black History Month is coming up in February as well. So really being able to look at some of that through a Catholic lens, I think will be really great. So make sure to stay tuned. And remember, if ever, for everyone who's watching and listening, send us your discussion ideas you can just shoot us an email. It's show at mncatholic.org, or you can just leave us a comment on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, or on Twitter. I will be back at the end of the program with this week's action item. I'm now joined on the Bridge Builder by Danielle Brown. She's the Associate Director of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism. Born and raised in the Archdiocese of Detroit, she is a lawyer licensed in the state of Michigan, Before coming to the USCCB in May 2018, she served on many boards, commissions, and ministries in Lansing, including co-founding and leading one of Renewal Ministries, First Young Adult Discipleship Chapters, ID 916, now simply known as ID. She's also a delegate at the USCCB Convocation of Catholic Leaders and the National Black Catholic Congress in 2017. Previously, she was a three-time governor-appointed appellate administrative law judge in the state of Michigan and an assistant deputy legal counsel to the governor of the state of Michigan. Danielle, what a privilege to have you on the Bridge Builder today. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jason. Happy to be here. Say a, you, you've got a great, fantastic background in so many different things. Um, you're a lawyer like myself, so we, you know, we are, are used to people uh, thinking that we're less than bottom feeders, but um, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll go with it. I always tell people, don't hold it against me. Um, but tell us a little bit about yourself and your ministry background um, and uh, just your passion for ministry and evangelization. Sure. I mean, it, it really was something uh, that the Lord initiated um, as sort of uh, cliche as that may sound. And I found myself um, really the recipient of some deep healing of, of things that had been building up in my life for years. And once that healing happened, I just, I couldn't shut up about the Lord and what he wanted to do in people's lives. And uh, when I really discovered, um, you know, the the active presence of, of Christ in day-to-day life and the fact that it could be accessible by everyone, again, you know, there, there was nothing I wanted to do more than help people access that. Um, so that really drove uh, me saying yes when presented with the opportunity to start young adult ministry, a very specific one in uh, the Diocese of Lansing, and uh, spread uh, sort of like a ripple effect to my desire to uh, potentially do it full time. Called and sent. What a beautiful story. Uh, yeah. So then that taking that next step, then you've, and you've taken on really a challenging ministry role as associate director at the USCCB's ad hoc committee against racism. What compelled you to then jump into that calling within a calling? Sure. Yeah, really, really well put. Um, you know, 
I, I can make a joke about uh, the person who recruited me to the position and say, you know, it was really his compelling, um, his being compelling, you know, but it was really, uh, it was really a, you know, at the end of my life, if I say no to this, will I regret it? Um, and, 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 and just this realization that it was probably a once in a lifetime opportunity, but combined with just a burning desire to, again, um, bridge a lot of the gaps that I had been seeing in the Catholic Church and, and really more than just seeing, experiencing in my own life and sort of the pain that it had caused um, me just to, to have a deficit of witness and a de deficit of, of voices speaking to particular issues um, or, or really just a normalization of uh, people who look like me and Catholicism. I, I found all of those things to be absent. Um, and I, I saw this as an opportunity to speak to, to those absences. A lot of us in ministry feel like we've had that calling of St. Matthew moment, like in the Caravaggio painting, right, right. Low, lowly sinners yet yeah. chosen and called, and someone just asked us to do this. So um, that right. certainly uh, resonates as well. Say a little bit about the gaps uh, that you saw in the church, and I think collectively with response to African-American issues or racism sure. generally, but we talk a little bit more about those gaps and the places like you thought you could really fill those gaps. Sure. So, you know, most particularly, and, and this is this is one person's story, obviously, but, um, you know, I, I started consuming uh, Catholic media and uh, I was consuming it because I wanted to learn. And so, you know, once I discovered that I could learn a lot about faith and go deeper into faith um, and 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 form my worldview and my spirit, my faith through really solid sources um, in media and online, I just started consuming them all the time. You know, I was, I was sort of a low level addicted, not even low level, I was addicted to Catholicism and I, I still am, praise be to God. Um, but after a while, I realized that, oh my goodness, you know, everyone who is, or most of the people who are transmitting these truths and most people certainly around me who are subscribing to these truths and really trying to live their lives as disciples out loud in my circles in the Midwest um, were for the most part people who were European American. That's not a problem except for after a while it can start to have an impact on one's self-image when the true, the good, the beautiful is only seen as being possessed by one people group. And I feel if I can just sort of make the jump now into that, that thought, um, that the Catholic Church, particularly in the United States, has really struggled with that um, and has, has, has not seen the potential for that truth, the goodness and the beauty to dwell in or to be understood by people outside of uh, European American groups. And um, that is not to say that there is anything wrong with um, the way in which, you know, the, the people who are, who are the transmitters of the faith today um, have done that over time. And, and there, is, there is absolutely nothing wrong um, with these voices. But uh, as I say to, to folks, after a while, once you get used to seeing the truth, the good, and the beautiful coming out of one people group only, it starts to affect the way that you see other people. It starts to affect the way that you view folks when you walk into a room. And so over time, if you were conditioned to believe that certain people groups most likely do subscribe to your same beliefs, Judeo-Christian values, um, it, it, it will start over time you to, to not see others as sharing those commonalities or, or even in, in extreme cases, having the ability to share those, those, same, those same views. And so I, I saw this work as an opportunity to speak to, uh, to those gaps. You have been involved in Renewal Ministries, and I'm a big fan. 
uh, especially of Ralph Martin and his work. And, and he, his contention is, is that in some way, since the council, the missionary impulse has been lost to a degree. And, and, it's, and I think some people have the sense that in the African-American community, uh, we've lost some ground. Um, many yeah. African-American men, especially, have converted to Islam. We have an attorney general here uh, who grew up Catholic and then converted to Islam, for example. And that despite the problems of under the underfunded Black and Indian missions in the early part of the 20th century, segregated parishes in some parts of the South, I think there's a sense among some that we've actually lost ground in terms of having, you know, really strong, vibrant uh, parishes and African American participation in church life. What What are your thoughts and observations on that point? I, I would say that it's it's most likely true, and and there are a number of factors. I think it's really hard to pinpoint um, why that is, but again. Um, the number of stories of folks uh, that I've encountered just in my few years with the conference, uh, wherein the person is African American and is now a pastor in some other uh, Protestant denomination, but grew up Catholic and was an altar server or uh, wanted to be a priest or wanted to be a nun, but, but you know, because of some slight or because of uh, somebody of influence who told them that people like you don't do that, they've found their homes in other places and found a way to be leaders in other places. And that is a black eye that uh, it will take some considered effort and uh, time to recover from. And, and yes, the missionary impulse is, is, is alive and well in, in the Catholic Church. And, and, you know, Renewal Ministries is an amazing example of that. There's, certain, there's countless other apostolates that we could point to um, that have the, that missionary zeal that's alive and well. But, um, you know, whenever I talk to apostolate leaders, whenever I talk to bishops, I have to ask them, how well are we doing ending the spiritual apartheid that exists in the Catholic Church, you know, and that that's a phrase that I actually uh, used when I was able to present to the teachers in your Catholic schools a few months ago, the spiritual apartheid, in my estimation, is the stratification of um, really access to and the propagation of the, the principles of the faith um, all, along racial groups. And it's nothing that people have necessarily tried to do, but there is this enormous gulf that exists between um, or Joe Ordinary person of color. You know, we're talking about African Americans, let's stay there. Joe Ordinary African American guy. How, how well aware is he of Catholicism? And how, how close are uh, his next encounters with it versus Joe Ordinary, European American? You know, how well aware of the Catholic Church is he and, and how, uh, how close are his next interactions with it? So we have to ask ourselves, how has society in the United States kind of been um, cultivated to make it more likely for certain ethnic groups to have dynamic encounters with Christ as, as his uh, presence and his, his fullness is within the Catholic Church versus other, other groups. Um, that's the real question, and, uh, and, and that's what we have to haggle with. So tell us a little bit about then the work of the ad hoc committee. It, se it seems that the mission is, is to, to correct some of those faults and to fill some of those gaps. So tell us a little bit about what the ad hoc committee against racism is doing, and then maybe draw the connection between the ad hoc committee's work and evangelization. Sure. So the ad hoc committee uh, was put together in response to sort of the resurgence of a lot of the violent clashes that were happening around 2015. 16 and 17. And if, if you'll, if, if any of us can remember, it seems like a whole world ago, 
Um, but, you know, the racial issues in the country were just starting to, to bubble up on a national stage. And uh, the bishops wanted a way to sort of, in a concerted way, be addressing those things. Um, one of the first large initiatives that the committee began um, exploring and executing were, uh, were listening sessions on racism, wherein the bishops were able to sit down with uh, their dioceses, people in their dioceses, and really listen to the experiences of folks who by all other accounts, had never had an opportunity to share directly to the bishop and to the brothers and sisters in the diocese what they've gone through. And so that process of helping the bishops learn what's currently going on, what, what did go on, and what has sort of uh, uh, created the uh, ecosystem that their diocese is and uh, created um, you know, a feeling amongst the laity as it relates to how well their diocese is um, transmitting the faith amongst their people groups has been a really important aspect. Um, but the committee's work cuts across just about every aspect of, um, of, of the church. And so we've done a lot of work with uh, Catholic education from K through higher education. We've done work uh, with consecrated life and vocations, uh, lots of addresses at uh, seminaries, um, as well as uh, diocesan retreat days for priests and bishops. And so a lot of the work has been um, simply trying to deliver the message, A, of the gospel, uh, but B, of the most recent pastoral letter, Open Wide Our Hearts, uh, to both the bishops, uh, the presbyterate, as well as the laity. Um, and, and so uh, the point here is uh, peeling back the layers that have been applied to this issue, um, setting the baseline that uh, the issue of racism is an evangelization issue. It is a, a, a salvation issue depending on where you are with this, because the fact of the matter is that, that we as Catholics believe that you get to see the Lord and enjoy the beatific vision when and if you have been completely purged of your sins. And so that includes sins of forgive, unforgiveness, and that includes, uh, yes, sins of, of, of racism. You know, we know the mercy of God and we know that his mercy is beyond our understanding. So we can't necessarily say by any ob obviously absolute means who will and will not be with the Lord. But we, we do believe that with sin, you cannot be one of those counted amongst um, his saints. And so applying this issue to racism, again, uh, Folks have to understand that uh, it is it is only in and through uh, a conversion and an understanding that any sort of um, anger or any sort of uh, hatred or any sort of um, sort of ill-formed conscious as it relates to one's brother and or sister based on ethnicity must be purged. Um, and it is an immediate issue, and it is an issue that um, that could potentially cause a person not to reach their eternal reward. Um, but but you know, moving more a little bit more towards the concrete, it is also an issue that prevents people from moving closer to Christ. And so, because of people's biased behaviors. We have, and, and I don't know the numbers specifically, but we do have, um, I would say, a significant number of people, particularly African Americans, who feel estranged from the church or who have completely left the church or who will not approach the Catholic church because of what they perceive to be a church that does not have concern for them and a church that is, um, I have heard people say intrinsically, uh, biased against them. And so that is a problem. And, and that is 
uh, something that that we still need to strive against and and there are pastoral needs for a significant number of people in the United States that the Catholic Church can do better to address. Well, Pope Francis calls us to understand all of the church's structures and ministries and institutions through the lens of evangelization. And I think you've highlighted and, and really drawn out for us that connection between the committee's work and evangelization and the reality that racism is a sin. It yeah. endangers our immortal souls. And okay. when we sin and engage in that, we create stumbling blocks for people okay. to encounter Christ. So beautifully said, Danielle, thank you for that. And I think that just gets to the very heart of the matter. We're speaking with Danielle Brown. She's associate director of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism. We're talking about her work on the committee, the bishop's outreach uh, against racism and its connection to evangelization. Danielle, you've highlighted well and, and underscored the way in which racism is a sin. And people understand, I think, intuitively at the personal level right. what that looks like. Um, but we also say, and the bishops also say that, that the sin of racism can be embedded in our society's structures. It can be a right. structure of sin. What do we mean when we say that racism can also be a structural sin or a sin of society? Right. So the Catechism um, of the Catholic Church in paragraph 1869 says that sins give rise to social situations and institutions. Um, and, and in this situation, they're talking about personal sins. So they say, sin, or, I'm sorry, the catechism says, sins give rise to social situations and institutions that are contrary to divine goodness. Structures of sin then are the expression and effect of personal sins that lead their victims to do evil in turn. Um, and so in an, in an analogous sense, they constitute a social sin. So we can see very clearly there that the catechism lays out um, some really acute aspects of this issue that we're seeing being played out in society. What are some of those structures of sin that the U.S. bishops are most particularly concerned about or have spoken to? Or what would you identify even personally as some of the real challenges when we're talking about structures of sin, just so we um, clarify and give some concrete examples for our listeners? Yeah, you know, the, the ones that I think uh, we see being played out as a committee and the ones that I get the most contacts about are um, inner city parishes, inner city parishes are, are constantly tr struggling to stay afloat. And a lot of times those are the parishes um, that uh, particularly African-American people have, have settled in. And so my committee gets contacted when African-American parishes or majority African-American parishes are being shut down or um, congregations of people are essentially feeling like they're being relocated due to new groups of people who aren't part of the original groups um, moving in to, to um, really become the predominant influences at those parishes. So why do I bring this up? I've found that there seems to be a, a pattern of, um, for again, a constellation of reasons and underfunding or an under support of these community churches. And in larger cities, a lot of uh, the inner city schools and, and parishes that were the locus of, um, of interface of uh, young African-American, particularly students, um, those opportunities have been uh, completely withdrawn from those communities. So whereas the Catholic Church used to be robust in bringing in, um, you know, sometimes even majority Protestant students into the walls of, of their schools, uh, their parish schools, and uh, facilitating conversion and, and, and facilitating bringing those students into uh, the Catholic family. This is Cardinal Wilton Gregory's story in, in Chicago. Um, we've removed these schools and we've removed the support of, of these churches. Now, can we say directly that those, those decisions um, were directly related to racism? No, we can't. But what we can say is that decisions were made later to essentially withdraw support because 
uh, the resources that would go to those schools, those parishes are thought to be better uh, spent and better targeted in other places. What we have to ask ourselves, and, and this isn't, this isn't a, a scientific analysis because we can't, I can't read the hearts of the people who existed you know, in the decades before, but, but what, what we have to be weary of is certainly the beginnings of decisions um, that were made by people before us that caused evangelical opportunities to be missed. And every time we close down an inner city parish, and, and a lot of them happened around the, the 2000s area, um, I'm sorry, 2000s time period, um, we have to ask ourselves, why did we make that decision? You know, and, and can we look at other situations where, where communities were allowed to do the fundraising and, and allowed to do the work uh, that would allow that school to remain open? Um, and I know I've given sort of a long answer, but just one more quick story. I was back home in Metro Detroit um, running an errand for my mother at the post office, and I ran into a woman working behind the counter, probably in her 20s, who went to a school, a high school, Catholic high school in Detroit that was shut down her 10th grade year. And she was expressing to me the sorrow in her heart over the school being shut down, but she was still carrying on her postal service ID, uh, the divine mercy prayer card and still had a rosary uh, wrapped around her mail stamp, um, which, which she wanted to show me that even though she was baptized Catholic and went to school Catholic and really isn't practicing anymore, that those same things are still in her heart, but it is a painful reality that all across the United States, the Catholic Church has failed to support schools like the one that she went to in Detroit that had a mission, and in some cases, in many cases, were doing it well, but for financial reasons, weren't able to continue. And, and all of the reasons that uh, inner city schools have a difficult time financially thriving versus suburban schools, they need to be examined because a lot of it has to do with economic opportunity and certain groups and, and which groups do and don't have opportunities to, um, to advance that way. And so it, it's not that, that racism is a cause for everything, but it is that executive decisions are being made with respect to communities of color that, that, that impact them negatively. And we need to look back and see where those things have happened and try to atone for them if we can. Yeah, simply because um, a certain type of parishioner has left the parish and that's as a dwindling population doesn't mean the people in the neighborhood, there are no that's longer it. people in the neighborhood. So why that's don't it. we go out that's and it. get them and bring them in? We're that's fortunate it. to have a new auxiliary bishop uh, being uh, ordained on January 25th who did just that in his parish the the white people left, um, but then he went out into the community and brought in largely Central American population, and now it's a thriving parish, and that's why he's going to be a bishop. So we're delighted to have Bishop Will, elect Williams uh, coming to the archdiocese and and taking that impulse and that sensibility um, out into the community and evangelizing people and putting the resources toward it. So well, very well said, Danielle. Thank you for that perspective. Sure, I'd be remiss if I didn't. Um, address a question with you that we get a lot of inquiry about critical race theory. Sure. And I think that we need good thinkers like you and, and resources helping us unpack that because although critical race theory started as an academic theory to, I think, understand what you described so well earlier as the structures of sin, right? And those, the way in which those are embedded in society and looking at things from that perspective of racial injustice which is a perfectly valid hermeneutic from an academic standpoint. But I think what people are troubled by is the way in which we're seeing things like specific propositions like race essentialism or defining everything in, in society in terms of victors, victims and oppressors, or that yeah. our primary identity is through our or through should be understood through a racial lens. And I think people 
are concerned by what they see in terms of the manifestations of that. So then we're seeing uh, drives in states to ban, quote, critical race theory from curricula. And I think other people are concerned that we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. We're throwing out a perfectly valid perspective when it terms of looking at social relations because of its excesses or its abuses. So from the standpoint of your work, either personally or through the USCCB's ad hoc committee, what do we do with this critical race theory debate? Sure. Um, first of all, we have to understand that it, that it's complicated. And, uh, you know, that sounds like a throwaway comment, but, it, but it, one of the biggest issues, Jason, is that when people start talking about critical race theory, um, even amongst people who are perceived to be on the same page, you ask them what critical race theory means to them. And oftentimes they have vastly different understanding mm -hmm. um, of, of what the phrase means. So, you know, folks have to slow down. Um, first of all, they have to slow down. Um, I think, Jason, that you really well defined what critical race theory is in terms of uh, its origin. And, and it did begin as a legal theory, absolutely. Um, but the way that it's been talked about, particularly in the last two or three years, it, 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 it has evolved. Um, the phrase has evolved to be used in, in public spaces and in the media, um, particularly amongst conservative media as kind of a catch-all for anything that has to do with race. Mm -hmm. That's a really big problem. So I, what I have seen is that it, far too much conservative folks or folks who are, maybe they're not conservative, but maybe they're just sort of nervous to talk about issues related to race. If you bring anything up related to race, they say that's critical race theory. It's Marxist. We shouldn't talk about this whatsoever. Um, which is problematic because there are large swaths of people in the United States, particularly people of color, um, who are exceedingly concerned about race and racism in the United States because of all the pains racism has caused throughout the ages. And that's something that we have to pay attention to, you know, and, and, where we find ourselves in trouble as Catholics is that it, it feels like we are in this point in time where Catholics are willing to just kind of cast aside large bodies of thought, large groups of people and say, we just need to sort of uh, circle the wagons and not let anything from the outside get in. Um, whereas we are sort of allowing um, society to, to take over. So our absence in conversations and our ability to stand firm in the teachings of the, the Catholic Church, Catholic social teaching as originally intended to be applied to uh, social life, our inability to stand firm and strong in Catholic faith has uh, allowed for us to have a completely incompetent response, if I can say that, um, to critical race theory. Because if we were able to stand strong in our faith and stand strong in a Catholic social teaching, we would have an ability to actually have conversation and dialogue with the questions that critical race theory presents, because that's really where we need to be concerned. Critical race theory is catching on because it seems to be a prescription for a problem that is huge. And, and, and many people have said, you know, it's, it's, it's the wrong prescription for a definite problem we have to bring our Catholic worldview, we have to bring our Christian worldview to these questions and our inability to do that is again, causing problems. Um, and so whenever I do hear people speak on these issues, 
um, again, particularly in conservative circles, there is sort of a, um, there, there can be an arrogance in communicating about these issues, but what people should understand is, it, well, what I believe is that in putting critical race theory to paper, people had a motivation to solve for why there is great pain and suffering that seems to be so much, so disproportionate in certain groups of people. And, and that's really, if Catholics want to start trying to, to figure this out, they can start there. Why is there so much pain and suffering in particular ways in certain communities? And what can we do um, to alleviate that based on the teachings of Christ and, and the mission of Jesus today? Just like with Marxism in the past, we had to understand what was alluring about that theory right. of social relations and what injustices did it speak to. And I think you're pointing out that the same is true with the attractiveness of, of critical race theory and uh, some of the associated worldviews associated with it. But at the right. same time, you point out so helpfully that the church has the resources and the tools to address properly identity politics and transcend the, the binaries and the polarization and the things like that. We can talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion right. as important values, but think of them in terms of the gospel and our identity exactly. as brothers and sisters and children of the one father That's right. and not make our secondary identities, our primary identities. And I think that's, right. that gets to the heart of the issue. So you, right. I think you're absolutely right. We need to unpack this more, but we need not be afraid of the conversation. Absolutely. And we have to be confident, as you well said, that the church has the resources to deal with these things. And it just underscores why we can't just fall into the typical polarized political camps, but really dig deeply and drink from the well of the church's resources here and then live that. And then to that point, Danielle, my final question for you would be, what practical things can Catholics do to combat racism and be instruments of evangelization? And I don't want to underscore or under... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to underestimate the importance of being nice to people. Um, <laughs> that's, that really matters. Uh, being kind, being yeah. kind is a great first step. But yeah. beyond being kind to people of different races yeah. and ethnicities, creeds, colors, etc., what are two, one or two things, practically speaking, that people can do to be instruments of, of combating injustice and racism, and then by extension, be modes of evangelization? Sure. So uh, a deep life of prayer is absolutely essential. And so I'm going to assume that that's already happening. Um, to enter into a deep life of prayer, particularly as it relates to this particular topic, I really want to um, ask people to pick up two books um, one is very short. It's called From Christendom to Apostolic Age, um, which was uh, which, which has a foreword by Monsignor Shea. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is The Soul of the Apostle. It is absolutely critical that people understand this book, uh, which was written a couple centuries ago um, on the road to being an apostle. So that's maybe number one. Um, pick up those two books and read and understand them. Number two is, is very concrete. Um, Joe Ordinary Catholic and, and, and Joe Extraordinary Catholic and Joanna um, can make a list of groups and, and institutions that they are a part of and figure out what their influence is in those groups figure out who's there and who's not, and then pray about which one of these groups you're most invested in, pray about which one of these groups um, that you feel most convicted to, called to, uh, to build up. And in the process of building that up, um, whether it has to do directly with uh, the church or, or it doesn't, what this person can start to do is figuring out who are the people that are there um, that are decision makers that could act to open doors up wide um, for people who may have been traditionally left out of those spaces. 
um, they can, if they are themselves the decision makers, figure out if there are barriers um, to people fully accessing um, resources that would lead to a thriving life. Uh, so if you are a teacher, you're figuring out, first of all, how well am I relating to all of the students under my influence? Am I relating fairly to all of them? And, and this is no sort of, um, I hate myself and I just figured this out. Therefore, I, I you know, I, I'm treating uh, the, the students who look nothing like me far better than I'm treating the students that, that do look like me. That can happen. Um, yeah. This is a right-minded, uh, clear view of your sphere of influence. What can you do uh, to lessen the impact of uh, poor decision-making that could have been made along racial lines less in your spheres of influence? Um, pray God, whatever you are doing is building up the body of Christ, whether or not it is directly related to the church. Do you have the ability to make decisions that can allow, particularly underrepresented groups or groups that have been traditionally left out, what can you do to help those groups have better access to truth, goodness, and beauty? What can you do to spread the gospel to people who aren't traditionally being um, preach the gospel in your sphere of influence? Can you start a Bible study? Can you start a group that maybe just listens to uh, the Bible in the Year podcast and gets together on the phone or on Zoom uh, once a week and talks about the fruit of that? And can you in invite people to that? Um, that aren't aren't just uh, European Americans, you know, and, and even if you live in the middle of the tundra that is Minnesota right now, and, and you don't even know where to find people of color, that's fine. Um, you can pray and, and, and you can pray fiercely and you can get on the phone and uh, talk to other people who, who do live proximate to, to people of color. Um, and ask them these same questions, you know, has this hit your radar? What do you think we could do? Uh, can I be a prayer support in your efforts uh, to lower the bars? So there's a number of things that we can do, but remember that this is an evangelization issue and this is an access to truth, goodness, and beauty as it exists in the, in the Catholic church. And, and finally, people can work on their own healing, period. Um, it, as healthy as you are, your communities will be. That's excellent. And fostering social, economic, ecclesial participation um, right. is just a really important value. And the church calls us the call to participation, one of the themes of Catholic social teaching. And <clears throat> you've really highlighted how we can do that and just think about that concretely. Who am I inviting into my spheres of influence, as you said? And those books you recommended highly uh, outstanding. I, I concur the soul of the apostolate. And then from Christendom to apostolic age with a former pop bridge builder podcast guest, Monsignor Shea writing the form. And I think published by our own university of St. Thomas here. So thank you for those book recommendations. And thank you, Danielle Brown, for joining us on the bridge builder program today. This conversation was really fantastic. Um, we'll have a tough time fitting it into the radio version, but uh, we're grateful for all your work in Washington and the important voice you bring to these issues. So thanks for joining us today. All right. Thanks, Jason. Where can people go to learn more about the Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism's work? One, one sure. final thing we want to share. USCCB.org slash racism. Outstanding. Danielle Brown, thanks so much for good, your good work and for joining us on the program today. Thank you. And we'll be back in a moment with our practical tip of the week. Welcome back to The Bridge Builder, where we help you bridge the gap between faith and public life. I'm Jason Atkins of the Minnesota Catholic Conference, and now it's time to take a look at our practical action tip of the week. Kit, what do you have for us? relates directly to the conversation you just had with Danielle. We want everyone to take some time to read through the USCCB's pastoral letter against racism. That letter is entitled Open Wide Our Hearts, The Enduring Call to Love. 
It was published in 2018, not that long ago, but it definitely still carries with it a lot that we can reflect on as Catholics here in America. And not only can you take some time this week to reflect and pray about what is in that letter, but the USCCB actually has a study guide to accompany that document as well. And so that'd be a really great resource to check out. Maybe you want to start a small group with some friends or family, or maybe offer it at your parish. That would be a really great opportunity, especially as we head into February, which is Black History Month. So you can find that letter and the study guide and other resources by going to the USCCB's website or simply doing a quick search online for USCCB and open wide our hearts. That should get you there. If you are listening on the podcast or on our YouTube channel, I'll put the link right in the comments. Thanks everyone for tuning in today. If you're listening on the radio, make sure to catch us on your favorite podcast app as well, or on our YouTube channel where we keep all of the extended conversations that just don't fit into that half hour radio program. And make sure to click subscribe when you're there. And then send us any of your comments or questions by sending sending an email. The address is show at mncatholic.org. And you can find all of our great podcast archives by going to mncatholic.org forward slash podcast. Thanks so much for joining us on The Bridge Builder today. We'll be back again next week with another great guest and a practical tip for building bridges between faith and public life. I'm Jason Atkins, and for Kitsapeniac at the Minnesota Catholic Conference, thanks for listening, and have a blessed day.